Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Brian Crane, and today I'm speaking with Ethan Frey, who's the co-founder, uh, who's the founder of Cosm Wasm, the founder of Confio. And you know, we're gonna get a lot into what that is and the kind of impact it has had. Uh, before we do that, just a brief word from our sponsor. So we have Tally Ho. Tally Ho is redefining the wallet as a public good. You can think of it a bit like a community-owned alternative to MetaMask. Uh, Tally O offers a smooth user experience compared to other wallets, impressive UI. Users can easily see all of their accounts at once and swap between assets within the wallet uh, at a much lower price. And they also have a great ledger integration, ENS support and UNS domain name support. They also recently added Polygon, uh, so as a first uh, side chain and you know it's easy and ready to use uh, on there and with tallyho you can also enter the metaverse with a web3 wallet that's fully community owned and operated and it's it's uh, controlled by the tallyho DAO and their commitment to community ownership goes pretty far so including that they became a first sponsor of etherjs so an open source javascript library to help developers connect to Ethereum. And they uh, pledge some of their tokens to a Gitcoin aqueduct. So go to tally.cash slash download to check it out. And uh, yeah, get involved in Tally Cash. So with that, let's go to uh, Ethan. It's great to have you on. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So Ethan, uh, we have known each other for quite a while. It's been, I don't know, five and a half years or something. So we were both, we both joined the Tendermint team uh, around the same time at the like very start of 2017. I think we were something like there was maybe three or four people before us. And then there was basically the two of us at the same time. We were both in Berlin and sort of as at the inception of uh, the Cosmos network. And so, uh, yeah, it's, and, and of course, Ethan has, has gone on to do lots of work, uh, especially in the Cosmos ecosystem that has, uh, you know, gotten to much, uh, much traction and much impact as well. So I'm, I'm excited to, you know, finally have him, you know, have you on, but maybe we can just hear a little bit like sort of about your background, like. How did you end up getting involved in the crypto space and in uh, the Cosmos ecosystem more specifically? Yeah, cool. Yeah, thanks for that intro. And it was actually really cool. 2017, remembering those days and then going out to some um, meetup back January 2017. I don't know if it was the first time I met or like second time I met in a cafe before that, but with um, Gavin Wood and Jay Kwan talking about multi-chain Polkadot and Cosmos and Vitalik was an audience. And it was like this early day of crypto in, uh, in Berlin. It was pretty cool, cool times. But yeah, I got into, I don't know, uh, crypto kind of found me. Like it didn't let me alone. And I remember someone was like pitching Bitcoin to me back in 2010, right? And, or 2011, it was 2011, I guess, as like the new money. And um, yeah, it was 2011. Um, and I just didn't, I don't know, like I saw this and like, oh, that's kind of cool. But like, I don't know, it doesn't do anything different than gold. So like, that's not cool. I don't know. Like I was not looking for an investor. I'm like, I have the worst investment mind. Do not accept any investment advice I give you of what's valuable, not valuable. But like, I was looking at the tech of it and I was kind of like looking at, you know, thinking about actually community currencies and like, you know, postmodern money and what the next generation of information money is when there's no scarcity and like concepts like this, um, before that, cause it's kind of my I don't know, hobby, I don't know, side projects um and bitcoin for me is like wow you can make money on the internet that's really stable and it's real but it's like gold and like well gold's a bit like you know old and then i heard ripple sometime and they're like oh like 2013 or something 14 13 13 i was actually some squat near barcelona and this guy was trying to turn me on to ripple and uh and, and they're like oh that's like just a like, decentralized iban uh you know swift network something like that it goes really fast and like so you can swap currencies i'm like i don't do foreign exchange trading i'm not a trader like what can i do with it he's like you can swap currencies i'm like okay <laughs> i didn't actually get into that at all and it was sometime around um but I kept coming back people kept trying to like pitch this stuff to me right and believed like the technology but not like the, the i didn't see it because i'm not a trader i didn't really get the get it uh from the money aspect 
and I want something new. And so in like 2014, 14, I was at a workshop in Berlin on sociocracy, which is interesting. And this guy came up to me, uh, the only guy in a suit in the whole whole place. And we started talking and he was trying to invent like a new program of money. And it was like, you know, on blockchain for ground money with the wallets holding all the assets and like you could have different community-based rules the governance creating this stuff, right? This is stuff that doesn't exist now. He's kind of this visionary. Um, and I got very, very intrigued what he was talking about because he said, you know, you could have basically community governed rules on the money. The money actually has rules, program of money, the idea. Uh, in 2014, which is pretty new for me, I was like, oh, that's cool. It can actually behave differently. That's interesting. We can invent our own money. So that kind of got me hooked on the idea of it. And so he showed me what Ethereum was like around the ICO time, the world computer ideas and like pointing me to Eris Industries, uh, which was, you know, Labor King Monax, which is like this incubator of tenement somehow. And I don't really know how this stuff is feeding together, but somehow through that, like to Eris, like that's cool. Like, you know, and then I saw this Go stuff. I'm like looking at this code. I'm like, well, this kind of makes sense. And then like started just like, and some like, oh, I can build a blockchain tenement. I like this tenement idea. That's a really cool idea. So I went and taught myself Go and got a job program in Go. And sometime in 2016, I started trying to build my own app on tenement. Um, you know, this is, and there's some like little Slack group of a bunch of other people trying to build apps on tenement. And I was like, you know, I still have that somewhere on GitHub. It's like React sign posts. I was like trying to make like a, basically a blog post that would just be, whatever, you could blog on the internet on the, on the blockchain or something um, with a React app and trying to figure out how to do that. And started like, yeah, I started working on this as like the first step of building program money on my own tenement chain uh, back in 2016, because I thought that would be, you know, easy, right? Um, and uh, and somehow I started going on there and filing a bunch of bugs on tenement and then patching bugs on tenement, because that's what I did. I was doing web dev for a while and contributed heavily back to open source projects like Mongo and Postgres and stuff. So, you know, you just patch bugs and you upstream them. So I started doing that. And, uh, and somehow Bucky's like, who are you? What are you doing here? Uh, who are you working for? I'm like, no one. I, I'm trying to build my own money. Uh, uh, this is cool stuff we got going on. He's like, work for us. I'm like, um, I'm happy with my job right now. And then like two months later, like I got angry at my boss. Well, who's making me work weekends and nights. I said, I wouldn't do that. So I said, I'm quitting if you make you work nights and weekends. So, um, so yeah. Then I said, hey guys, I'm open. And uh, met them in, met them in Zurich, November, 2016. And they basically red pilled me. Red pilled me on IBC, on Tendermint, on POS, on everything. And uh, yeah, I, I can't leave it since then. Cool, amazing. I wasn't actually aware that you, you kind of like found it through Eros Industries, which is the company I was also working for in 2015 and 16. So that's. And maybe talk a little bit about what did you work on in the time when you were, you know, at Tendermint or like at, at the company back then? Yes, yeah, so the first thing I did was really work on the IVL tree and try to speed it up. So I did some uh, benchmarking, early benchmarks and tests on it and then try to speed it up, which was like then, um, things are too premature, we don't need to speed up anymore. <laughs> so, so I guess it's true at the time, early 2017, but like now it's in these bottlenecks. And then moved on to try to build like apps. So I actually basically took what was Basecoin, which is a little app they had, demo app, and try to make a real app, clean it up. I So I turned it into... I started doing the first uh, prototype of IBC based on the, uh, the very vague spec in the white paper. Um, I then made said, hey, this laps are limited. Let's build something real. So I built the um, the first version of the Cosmos SDK. The 06, 07, 08 was basically me building it out uh, over, the, over the summer with help from Rigel a bit. Um, I built that out heavily. I came up with the whole idea of the REST client, LCD, was like we're trying to sign it. I was working with... Um, uh, was Matt and Judd from Nomic now. They're working there and they're trying to build front-end apps and they couldn't actually sign Amino transactions. So I'm like, okay, let's make this like little, small little REST server app that like helps you do the cryptography on the si- server side until we have a proper JS Amino library in six months from now. Um, so yeah, I did this stuff. So I'm sorry sometimes because that got legacy code, but whatever. It was in advance of the time to allow that whole LCD REST server idea. I built SDK out there. Um, and then that was kind of frozen for a lot of internal discussions. The SDK was put on basically hold um, to be considered and reconsidered. Um, and then meanwhile, I basically wrote the IBC white paper. So if you saw anything about IBC in 2017, that was like I wrote a whole spec out of it, uh, which is now ICS 20. So IBC got bigger and bigger, like the concept got bigger. But the, t- the original time was basically token transfer. So I basically spec'd out token transfer uh, with the idea of acknowledgements 
um, and timeouts, uh, cleanups, uh, stuff like that, rather than just having these fire and forget messages. Um, so I wrote a bunch of stuff, Merkle proofs, ICS23. I wrote the light client proofs and stuff like that. I was really, really in IBC. Um, and some of that code's still around. It moved up four times. All that light client proof stuff moved up four times in repos. And I think it's in Tendermint now. Uh, but yeah, if you look way, 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 way back once I was the author of that. Cool, very cool. And and then what's, uh, how did you end up working on uh, Cosm Wasm? Yeah, so um, I basically, first I, a little frustrated at the pace in, in AIB because there's a lot of decisions being made and they're all pretty much made in California time, at, which is like, you know, my evening. Um, and if, you know, by 11 a.m. their time when they're waking up, I was pretty much clocking out of work usually. Uh, it was 9 p 8, 8, 8 p.m. in Berlin. Um, so I was not really involved in decision making. And in fact, no one in Berlin was really. And it felt like decisions were made somehow. And anyway, um, uh, the SDK was basically put on hold indefinitely. I had nothing really to work on. And a few other things got blocked on working on. So I said, this is kind of boring. I want to build something. So I said, I'm going to build my thing. So I found another company that was offering to hire me. I said, cool, I want to build another SDK. So I basically took the idea, built the first SDK, built something called Weave at IOV. Um, and it basically had, you know, uh, so in early 2018, I had protobuf going on there. I had a JavaScript uh, front end that was talking directly to it. So you had basically, you know, Cosm.js talking with no light client, directly protobuf signing messages and calling them. We had multisigs in there. Um, yeah, in 2018, kind of built out the basic stuff. Um, some basic groups, governance modules and stuff like that were in there as well. And a lot of the... And some basic um, swap token stuff um, in there. That was, I did a 2018. And then towards the end of that year, I realized that like there was not really a business going around with this stuff. It was cool. We had a nice team. We were building this stuff up. We had a business case. It wasn't really m maturing. Um, and there's a little, yeah, internal issues, let's say. And so I got a little, I don't know. I watched the SDK go its own pace and uh, go its own pace. And then like, you know, get more and more and more devs. And um then I showed up at uh, Interchain. That's a really like, fucking awesome, uh, sorry, I should bleep that out, but awesome uh, conference there, 2019. Um, I'm pretty sure you there too. Um, of course, one was like, yeah. Ja I was, um, yeah, the Interchain conversations in Berlin. That was really awesome, really awesome. Like everyone from the Cosmos came, the Cosmos had been launched like three months earlier. And like, I don't know, everyone showed up there, like it's everyone, right? And like, no one even had their own blockchains then. It's kind of like all these people had their little projects, small projects, right? Um, it was an amazing group of people show up there, three demos of conversations and, and discussion, and then a hackathon at the end of it. And in that, I met a lot of cool people. Um, and we kind of come together, it's like, let's build something. And I realized that like, you know, yeah, no one's gonna take Weave. Uh, and I'll drop it and they'll look, use SDK again, but I'm you know, not really want to hack an SDK so much, but let's do something. And, uh, then I was sitting around this table and we kind of got a bunch of people that are floating around anyway. It was like me, Aaron, uh, Regen, Yehan, who's now in formal from Altea, um, Shane, who's now at, uh, Stargaze. And then somehow Pedro from Wallet Connect showed up there. Um, and we ended up like, so let's make a team and let's build Wasm contracts and, Let's build Cosmos and smart con or Wasm smart contracts in the SDK. I'm like, sure, why not? It's two days. Um, and, and it was basically three of us working on it. Like they also built the groups module kind of in the way, multi-stake stuff um, at the same time, Shane and Aaron. And then basically it was like, uh, um, you and me building that and, uh, and Peter from Wallet Connect on the front end. So we just knocked it out on the weekend. I didn't sleep. I kind of like closed my eyes for an hour. Um, and yeah, I learned a lot of Rust and Yehan was doing amazing stuff there too in Rust. And um we knocked it out. It was awesome. We got contracts working. It was crazy. We were uploading contracts and running them. So it was like, you know, don't push it falls over. But like, if you, if you do it right, it ran. So it was pretty amazing for us, actually. Um, and I got super excited for that. I said like, yeah, this is awesome. It's the most awesome project I've worked on in years. And like this green field of like building something new. Um, and it's compatible with everything else people are using already. So that was really what I learned. It's like, you know, I don't want to fork this to and go off my own way or make my own version and compete. Like really like everyone wants to use this tooling. Let's build the tooling and add power that everyone can use it and be compatible with everyone. Um, so that was really cool. And I said, I got a grant from that. One of the prize got a relatively small grant uh, to follow up on it and said, let's all build it, guys. I know we'll do a few hours a week and, um, and everyone else is too busy. They're all CTOs. It was like a team of CTOs. And I was the only one that said, okay, I quit my job and start doing this. 
Um, so yeah, I did. And, and three years later, it's, <laughs> it's what it is. Cool. Awesome. Well, maybe we can take a zoom out a little bit because so WebAssembly, right? I think a lot of people have heard of WebAssembly, right? WebAssembly has often been kind of touted as, oh, it's this like, you know, powerful platform. Uh, Ethereum, I think at one point was like thinking of adopting WebAssembly. You know, there were some other projects that were like very heavily uh, emphasizing WebAssembly. I think especially I remember Definity was always like WebAssembly, WebAssembly. Can you can you tell us like what is WebAssembly and like what's interesting about WebAssembly? WebAssembly, it's a funny history. It was originally trying to make the web faster, which is called WebAssembly, but it's nothing really to do with the web anymore, except that it can often run in the web. Um, there's some project called ASMJS that from Mozilla that was trying to like anyway, optimize JavaScript so you could pre-compile it, JIT or ASD faster. Um, anyway, then they basically made think of WebAssembly, which is a VM. And I think if Ethereum had done two or three layers la years later, it would have used it. It's a very, very simple virtual machine. Um, it's a 32-bit processor with some stack calls that has like 150 operations. Um, it's a pretty simple, relatively simple architecture. It involves no runtime, no system. Um, there is, I think, a way of allocating memory and um, like no garbage collector, just like allocate blocks of memory, like expand the memory space I want to have access to. See how much memory space I have access to and expand it linearly, right? Like that's all it has. Um, and everything else is added as an optional import or export. If you want to expose something, you make an export. And if you want to call into the external system, you import. And you have to assume you have this, this dynamic that like the system you didn't have access to files, no access to network, no, nothing. Um, and I think if you consider the JVM, which is the first real popular VM there, um, Java virtual machine, that came out there and that was basically like at a whole runtime. You have like the virtual machine, which has a 32-bit architecture with the stack and pushing stuff on it and how it worked, but also the system library of how to interact with the system and how to interact with the files and how to interact with its whole POSIX client system. It's basically an operating system, basically not just a virtual machine. And this defines a processor. It defines a processor, nothing else. And anyone can plug any system they want to. Like there's a project called WASI, um, Web Assembly System Interface, which is kind of a POSIX-like interface, um, which it says it, we expose exports into it so they can use it. And then you can say, okay, we only give you access to these three files. And that's all you see in the whole world. And you can control the control it somehow. If you compare it with, you know, like a VM that people are kind of like familiar with in the, in the blockchain context, it's, you know, the Ethereum virtual machine. So what are the advantages or maybe disadvantages that this virtual machine has versus the Ethereum virtual machine? So I said the first thing is this general purpose, which is a good and a bad thing, right? The EVM is built for Ethereum blockchain or a blockchain. And it comes with all these pre-compiles for computes and it comes with a whole lot of understanding of like where things are called and the interactions of calling other functions. It's very... And these call methods, which require blockchain, it's like the virtual, the language of VM is tied to a blockchain. You have call functions, create functions, like with bytecode, like it's tied to itself. It's tied to this concept of the EVM. It's not separated from the runtime. It's like the EVM is not just a machine, it's the runtime, uh, which means it's like very, like the JVM is for one use case, right? And it's, it has a use case and it's very tailored, which can be very good because it's tailored towards it. Um, the bad thing is you have no tooling around it and you have no optimization around it. And I think we see it as being slow. We see it has issues. And I think what happened with WebAssembly is it's a very generic one, it's a very general purpose one. And so suddenly a lot of different languages start targeting it. And they said, oh, we can write C and compile that to WebAssembly, right? We can compile C++. We can compile Rust. We can compile the WebAssembly. There's a project called TinyGo. They call it Go to WebAssembly. Um, there's... Uh, a bunch of other projects that are like in progress for lots of other languages. And I mean, it works best for static type languages, low level languages right now. Um, but a lot of different languages being compiled like Haskell, there's some Haskell to the WebAssembly thing. So you can take all these using language and compile it to as a backend and it, they can just run at it. Like they run on a um, Intel architecture, they run on a Mac M1 ARM architecture, right? They run on some older embedded CPUs. They can run on a WASM. Uh, WebAssembly VM. Um, so I think 
that fact, first of all, allows this whole tooling of lots of different front end coding. You have to build your own language and your own stuff. You can use existing code. And the second thing you do is because of that interface, no one else tries to build, other people try to build the VMs. And so people build just interpreters for it faster and faster, right? So there's like an interpreter built in your browser. There's probably two or three of them out there, right? One from Google, one from Mozilla, I think one from Safari. Um, there is a uh, WASI, which is implemented by Polkadot, which is an interpreter, which doesn't, is not legit. Um, a lot of them will take that WASI code and compile it into optimized local code and run it there, sandbox local code. So it makes it much faster. It's like an optimization called just-in-time compilation. Um, there's WASM, which we use, and WASM time, which are two kind of competing things, um, which also do either pre-compiling or uh, just-in-time compiling of the code to native code and run it to get really fast compilation. Um, there's some other ones out there too. So there's a bunch of smart people doing it and you're not tied to one project interpreting it. You're not tied to one project building tooling around it. You're leveraging five, six different language ecosystems. The entire tooling of Rust you can use just out of the box with WebAssembly. And then you have like five or six different backends you can choose from and who's going to write you the VM, who implements a VM that runs this WASI. So it's a standard, basically. It's a standard middleware. And it's not really tied to a blockchain or anything else. People are running Redis in WebAssembly system interface, right? So you can do anything in it. Um, and then it allows you to leverage this huge amount of tooling and people are working optimizing it as fast as they can. So Rust is really heavily optimized, amazing compiler engineers. And in Wasm time, they're compiling Wasm to like the most efficient bytecode they can. Um, and they're getting some really, really impressive stuff. They have really impressive compiler, low-level designers working in this full time that we're not paying for, that like multiple people are paying for and like top of the line stuff that you're not trying to recruit them as your own blockchain project. You just like leverage them. So I think it's because it's a whole ecosystem and it's so compatible and so generic, it allows this huge ecosystem of many companies to build, to, to collaborate, which makes it powerful. Um, at the time the EVM was launched, it was not around. It was not available. It was kind of in some way idea stage. It was, I understand when they built the EVM. They had to, that was the best of the time they could have done. But like now I see that came out later and they say, hey, this is a whole ecosystem. We can use it. And then we just customize a few things on it. Like the entry points, we expose the contracts and we can run it. So Polkadot is running all completely on WebAssembly as well. Thanks. So That's very helpful. When you, when now, now let's talk about Cosm Wasm. I guess one thing that probably a lot of people are not aware of, and maybe you can talk a little bit about it, right? But is that in, in cause in the Cosmos SDK, right? You have this concept that there's like different plugins, right? So you, you have these different modules and then there will be like, a, you know, a module that's like a staking module or, or a mod, the IBC module. And, and you have these different modules and then, you know, the different SDK blockchains can say, oh, we use some of them. We develop some of our own. And then, you know, cause and wasn't right basically means like, okay, you're taking this web assembly and you're putting it as a module inside the Cosmos SDK. Is that, is that correct? And like, what, what are some of the, what are some of the, you know, the consequences of like putting the web assembly inside this Cosmos SDK framework? Yeah. Yeah. It's a kind of funny question actually. So like, you're right. The, there are these modules and so the SDK is a pretty amazing plugin set. So you can add different modules. Um, and it's easy to kind of like import code from here, add your own code and extend it. It's meant to be extensible. It is. It's very extensible. What it does require, though, is a hard fork every time you want to change it. So if you write, like you deploy a new AMM module, right, and you want to add it, then you have to basically get that merged into the main code base of the code and then get the entire blockchain to stop, switch out the binaries out there, run some script. Now it's a little more optimized. Before that was like a whole dump, dump state restart, like three hour issues. Now it's down to like five, 10 minutes, but you still need to record the entire blockchain to stop or just restart and come with a new code to add the new module, remove module, update it, right? Um, and that is a lot better than working on like Bitcoin when you try to change it, right? The core logic of Bitcoin or Zcash, but it's still not like the smart contract development speed. So it makes sense for core functionality like governance and staking, but we said, hey, for smart contracts, a lot of things just like add them on top. They don't really matter. You want to deploy them quickly. So what we did is we don't store the WASM inside of it. We store the WASM VM. So we wrote this entire like... We took the WebAssembly virtual machine uh, from Wasmer. We wrapped it with some standard callbacks. So it basically explained its place in the world, how it can talk to blockchain, 
So a program can also say, hey, uh, query this other part of the blockchain or uh, send tokens over here or call this other contract, right? We exposed some functionality to it in a certain frame, in a certain functions to it. So, okay, these are your extra special functions for Cosm Wasm contract on top of a normal Wasm contract. And um, so we built the virtual machine and the Rust into a basically a library, which we embedded in a module. So it's a bit crazy. We built basically a, a Rust mo library and a DLL and then embedded that into a Go binary. So it's running here. Um, and the Wasm code is never actually in that binary. The Wasm code, you upload in a transaction, just like in, in kind of Ethereum when you upload code. So the actual, the virtual machine and the, the runtime is in this module, which then actually calls into every other module of the system. Um, but the actual, um, the Wasm code you upload a transaction, it stores it in state um, of the state of the thing, and then just loads that code when needed. Yeah, so that's an important thing, right? Because yeah, in the Cosmos SDK uh, paradigm, right? Like somebody wants to modify some plugin, some module, and then that requires changing this code, new binary, you know, like all the validators have to change it. It's a lot of friction. And here the thing is, I can write a bunch of code. I put it into a transaction. The transaction gets sent. And then this Wasm VM kind of like unwraps that and then it has that code, right? And so nothing has nothing outside has to change, but now all of a sudden you have like that code in there. And I guess that's particularly attractive if, and then I guess that's also where Cosm Wasm has been, has found uh, a lot of usage in the Cosmos ecosystem is like, oh, I want to create a general smart contract chain, right? Where everyone can sort of, put their own contracts on that. Cause that's something that Cosmos SDK without something that Cosmos wasn't, doesn't really support well. Yeah. And a lot of things need to move faster and they don't want the whole chain, like a purpose chain to be a DEX. I think they built really good DEX on Osmosis. They based on balancer ideas and some ideas from curve. And they basically, I think it's solid. It's a well understood question, right? But now when you're trying to build stuff on top of it, like, okay, a lending protocol, and we want to do some leveraged option stuff on it. And they're like, okay, we actually want the faster Cosm Wasm on it. Uh, NFTs are moving too fast. Like people are trying to code some Go NFT thing, but it's like, it's months behind the space. So like, I think things that move, need to move faster, um, it's essential. And so contracts only the privilege of a user account, external account. They have no more privileges than another account than you do, than I do. This on the code. They have their own, the logics on the blockchain. Um, but they have no more privileges. They can hold tokens, they can move tokens, they have different rules. Um, so it's great for things like that, which is simple app logic that people want to add. And I think the SDK is amazing for things like, oh, we want to change how fees are handled. We want to change how consensus works and government votes work. We need to change our like, you know, a spam middleware protection. And we need to implement IBC as native control, which is totally trusted, 100% trusted verified code on here, which is stable and not changing the foundation of other things. So SDK is a great way of composing lots of different projects together to build foundational levels, right? Whereas Cosm Wasm said, okay, if you want to do just like business logic, app logic, not foundational blockchain stuff, let's do it there. Um, and I think that's a great combination. So the, you have five, six different teams composing stuff and adding things in there as modules so they can build this SDK base layer. And Cosm Wasm said, okay, now all those hundreds of devs that want to run on top of a chain or thousands of devs now that want to run on top of a chain, um, you can just do it. Right? You don't worry about that platform. You don't worry about who's paying what consensus and what the gas fees are. You just worry about like running your logic. So I think it allows these two things to live side by side very well. Yeah. But then like you mentioned Osmosis, uh, like Osmosis right, doesn't have generalized smart contracts. Right? It's not like anybody can just go and like put some stuff on, on Osmosis, but uh, they are also, I think, leveraging Cosm Wasm in some ways. Can you talk a little bit about like, because because as on the example of like generalized smart contract chain, right? Like Juno is one example, uh, probably the best known example in the Cosmos ecosystem, right? Where you have this Cosm Wasm chain and like you know lots of different people are building like lots of different stuff on that. But can you talk about the other example, right? Where you're using Cosm Wasm in in a more controlled way or in a more permissioned way. So a number of chains have actually adopted a little more conservatively than Juno has. So there's, you know, early adopters like Juno and Bostrom from Cyber Congress, some early. I mean, before that was actually Terra and, and Secret, the first ones, um, as permissionless. But the, uh, yeah, the first one, modern IBC one was Juno, I guess. What they've done is most of the same thing on Stargaze, 
which is basically permissioned contracts. It doesn't mean that it allows you to dynamic upload code, but requires governance vote to allow you to use your code, right? So they basically want to vet all the code on their thing. It's a way of saying, hey, Stargaze only wants NFTs on there and stuff. So if you want to upload a project with NFT, you basically say, hey, I'm building a project with NFT. I want to launch on your chain. They say, yes, okay. And they say, hey, no, this is some like DeFi product you don't want on our chain. Don't come to our chain. So they control that first step of being able to upload that contract and instantiate it. Um, once the contract's on the chain, it's permissionless, right? Like you can do anything you want with it once it's on the chain. You basically just have to ask to get in the front door. And after that, it runs just like any other contract, any other chain. So it's mostly the same thing. They kind of wanted to have a, um, like well, everybody can experiment on Juno and do stuff on Juno and anyone can do anything on Juno. Um, they wanted more like a um, app store feel for Osmosis. They wanted to have like, you know, five protocols maybe on there, the building on there, they can integrate into the ecosystem there, uh, slowly allow them in there, which allows them to scale out, not like a general purpose, but they say, okay, we can have five different dev teams building different projects and they don't have to get in the core code base. They can't break a code. They can't break the rest of the chain. They only can build their own little project. So they actually, we they basically just make agreements with projects beforehand. Like if you want to run Osmosis, talk to them. And if they like your project, they say, cool, when you finish it, we'll let you go on there. More or less, right? It's like uh, you basically get permission first. And once you do that, you just write your code like you do in Juno. You go through a process to get approved to get on the chain. And once it's on the chain, then it runs like anywhere else. So it's, um, except you have access to DEX on chain, which is actually pretty cool. So some people leveraging it for lending protocols, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's... Um, I think that's an option we came early on and we built that early on as an option and it's really being used this year. So people being like, I want to have Cosmosm, but I want to control, I'm an app chain and Cosmosm chain. I want to actually have them both, best of both worlds. Like, uh, um, yeah, I'm going to have a curated set of applications on my chain, but allow third-party devs to easily extend it. And yeah, I guess you, you mentioned Terra, right? Which is actually important because uh, probably a lot of people are not aware that, you know, Terra was also using Cosm Wasm and, you know, all these things that were being built on Terra. I mean, I guess, again, with the exception of, of a bunch of foundational uh, stuff that was like part of the chain logic, but, you know, the, the applications people were building on Terra were built in, in Cosm Wasm. They were the first adopter of Cosm Wasm. I want to say though, I want to say one thing. UST was not Cosmosm. UST was not built on Cosmosm. That predated Cosmosm on the chain. They had a chain with UST. The UST Luna whole thing, Treasury. I didn't even understand it, but that was existing beforehand. Um, but all the other protocols, so TerraSwap and, um, and even Anchor and Mir Protocol, um, B Luna, and then the whole series of Lavana and Mars and all these other protocols pumping out, they were all on Cosmosm. Um, they were the older version, the upgrade actually to recent version. Um, but yeah, it was its own Cosmos ecosystem, so it didn't have IBC support. That kind of actually ties into my, my follow-up question here. So Cosmos, you have this basically kind of, you know, separate container, right? Where like code lives and you can kind of like things happening there. And then you have like, you know, other Cosmos modules, like, you know, for instance, uh, there's an IBC module, right? Which is like sending transaction to other chains. So I guess, you know, the calls and walls and contracts have to somehow talk with these other modules or, um, so how, how does that interface work? And, and there, are there like some limitations around this? Yeah. So we basically expose some modules. Um, what it's actually JSON, it passed JSON basically, because we saw it's easy to debug and us, you know, if you can play on JSON being there, not proto buff, talk to Yehan. Uh, he mentioned JSON is the best way because you can easily debug it. And um, dev tooling, but basically pass between that, it calls the system with the JSON blob, says, hey, talk to the bank on it. And we define an interface for the contracts. They can call in the bank module to mint and burn tokens. They can call into the um, staking module to stake tokens and delegate and claim the rewards. Uh, they can call into uh, the governance one to vote, for example. Um, they can call the IBC module to send tokens. We also allow custom IBC callbacks. So you can actually have an IBC protocol built as a contract. I want to get that later. Um, and we allow people to have custom callbacks, right? The thing called a custom. So basically you say, okay, we give you a standard set of things, but chains will all want to tie their own ones in there. So we have an extension point that you don't have to fork Cosm Wasm. You don't have to fork our VM. You don't have to fork Wasm to anything. You can use a whole framework. And this is an early thing we did early on to make sure people not fork it. And said, if you want to expose a Dex Osmosis, you can 
add a special callback to say, okay, these, we have a new structure here, which you can add embed into the other message called custom. And our custom type is osmosis message and it runs here and allows you to talk to the decks. So it basically defines a, a format, um, a JSON format that you can use for, uh, for defining callback to your native module. And then on your, on your blockchain, you basically interpret that to do those things. So you invent your own message API between the contract and your native blockchain. Um, and a number of people have used that. Um, quite a few have used that as an extension point. And I want to actually mention this, not just on Cosmosm. Cosmosm is not just on Cosmos anymore. It is running on a substrate chain, which I think is a pretty uh, impressive engineering feat. So Composable Finance has launched uh, a hook up parachain and they have Cosmosm running in substrate. Um, and it's integrated with a bank module. It's not, I think, tied to the staking module, IBC, they have an IBC yet. Um, but they just run it on, you can run contracts like a CB20 contract and you can run an NFT on it. You can use the same contracts there. They have a different JS front end, but like the back end runs the same. They uploaded actually unmodified contracts onto it and running a substrate chain, which is pretty cool. And what's the, what's the benefit of that? If, you know, as you said that, uh, Polkadot already uses WebAssembly. So why port Cosm Wasm onto Polkadot? Yeah, I don't know why Polkadot uses WebAssembly, honestly. Um, they use WebAssembly as a base layer. The, the whole chain is running in WebAssembly, but like the same way everything's written in Go, it's Rust, it composite WebAssembly. So, but you have to upgrade it, you know, hard fork of the chain. And in, I guess in theory, you can hard fork the chain without a restart or like automatically restarting it. So you upload it, but it's all permissioned. It's, it's a very complicated thing. You have to recompile the whole thing and then you upload these pieces. And I, I still have yet to see it be done uh, flawlessly, but um, there, the idea is basically allow easier upgrades, but still government permissioned. And basically you have one new WebAssembly binary you're, you're switching out to, right? Like it is a giant WebAssembly project, not a smart contract. Um, they have, um, but it doesn't allow with third parties, just the chain developers. Same with SDK does it, they just use it as a target. They also have something called uh, Inc, which is smart contracting language, which compiles to WebAssembly and they upload that and run that as user controlled uh, things. But it's not really caught on. It was actually existing before Cosmosm was dreamed of. Right, like I saw demos of it, like when I wrote Cosmosm awesome and then looked over, I saw like they had done something similar, um, but never really took off. I I think it's overly complicated, and but I don't know. I don't really know why. The truth is, Inc has never taken off over three years. All the funding about Web three, and uh, there's a project composable that is really tied into the Polkadot ecosystem that uh, had tried Inc and were frustrated with it. So frustrated they decided to port Cosmosm awesome into a substrate uh, crate a palette. They're called, I think, like a modules. Um, uh, the VM and talk to us to figure it out and then, you know, make it compatible because they thought Cosmos was such a nicer target than writing ink contracts. So I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know if that's a good business choice, but they did it and they're happy with it and they're running their stuff on it and they're trying to work IBC as well. So uh, that's cool. Um, but I think the point was it was designed actually the same way that the WebAssembly virtual machine is not tied just to blockchains or Ethereum blockchain. Um, the Cosmos virtual machine system we have it runs great. We have a binding in the cosmos and we love to embed in the cosmos, but like they have embedded somewhere else and it can be embedded other places as well. So it's actually relatively, um, um, relatively universal uh, target, which I think might hopefully in the next few years extends. I'd love to see it like an avalanche or new year or something like that also running Cosmosm. Yeah. Maybe that ties into the question of kind of where, where do you see Cosmosm going? Is there a lot of, what does the development roadmap look like? Yeah, so our original goal, we released 1.0 back last fall um, and fall 2021. And I think our goal is then to get change using it, right? All upgrading to use it is an IBC enabled version of it using Stargate, IBC, all that stuff. That took some months and this, this springtime I was amazed. We went from like, you know, four or five chains using it to like, you know, 13. Now it's over 20 chains using this, right? So we first was like, actually, let's get people using it. And the second thing I, uh, we're working on is getting more devs on. And Terra did a great job getting devs on it. Juno, Osmosis, they're getting a lot more devs on this stuff. Um, and we're working on a thing called Academy, academy.cosmos.com, and we want to train up devs. So right now what we're doing is basically trying to build the ecosystem. So the, we got the change running it. You have 20 chains plus running it now. We're giving free classes, free tutorials, free tooling for, for devs to learn it, to really build the Degu system from several hundred, maybe a thousand devs into far many more, like Ethereum is a huge number. We want to build this out. And 
what I really see as differentiator and what I want to work on and what I am working on, besides like helping people, building tools and, and tutorials for people, is IBC. So inner chain contracts. It's like I did this in Seoul and the hack at them. Um, I demoed it and some people hacked on it and like Jake did some and some guy from Taiki from Japan did another one. Um, it's pretty awesome that you can basically deploy a contract on two different chains. They talk to each other with like no trusted bridges, no multisigs, nothing can be hacked in the middle of them. Just like pure guaranteed message passing uh, with complete uh, security of IBC. Um, and the contracts just hold the app logic. Like if you if you send a message that says mint token or mint token or not, I don't know, or make a governance vote or control this DAO or or change the threshold of my 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 LP pool thing or whatever you want to do. It's kind of like interchain accounts, but like so much more powerful because you can actually write contracts on both sides. And that was not possible until you actually had multiple important chains running Cosmos and 1.0. And we were waiting for like three, four months ago. It was like, actually, okay, great. Like Juno, Secret, uh, Juno's Moses are now 1.0 and Secret's upgrading very shortly. And I think those are three of the top chains behind the hub uh, on the ecosystem in terms of market cap, at least. And they're all running. Injective also is another big chain. They're also running it. So like a lot of people are running it now. So most of the chains that have the hub are running Cosmosm, which means you can actually build a protocol that spans three, four, five chains uh, using IBC messages and write the entire, not just your app logic, but actually the protocol communication there. That's like writing your own API servers and talking blockchain to blockchain with like no bridge hacks involved. And that's really why it's the future. And that's really where I'm going to put a lot of work into not just not just uh, building it, but also documenting, trying to explain it, but also trying to build these things out there because, hey, I'm trying to build something that doesn't exist yet. So it's hard to teach people tutorials something that doesn't exist. So I got to build this stuff first and then show you how to build it. Um, but I've just built some prototypes out there and it's amazingly fast. So I think one thing we did talk about before uh, on this podcast, we maybe some people have heard of, are aware of, is in Cosmos, this concept of interchain accounts, which basically you have like an account on one chain and then you can control it from another chain. So let's say, uh, for example, there's a project Quicksilver, right? And they're doing liquid staking with that. So that this Quicksilver chain can control an account on Cosmos. It can, the Cosmos hub, it can, you know, stake atoms, voting governance, you know, claim rewards, you know, do all those things. And then, but it's controlled by another blockchain that, you know, could then issue like a liquid staking token. So that's like an example of interchain accounts. So obviously many examples. Now, what you're describing, right, is basically goes even a step further, right? Because you basically have like contract code on both sides, whereas here it's kind of like, let's say in the Quicksilver example, it's kind of like contract code on the one side, right? And then on the other hand, it's just like a normal account. Uh, can you talk a little bit about use cases? Like what are some of the things that, you know, you could like you'd be interested in building or y you can imagine people building, uh, you know, these cross chain Cosm Wasm apps. Yeah, I will. I will. So I think in some theoretical way with token transfer, I know accounts, you may be able to build anything, may be able to, and interesting queries. If you add that, like those might be fundamental principles. Say so these are holy principles. We can build anything with them, um, but they're inefficient to build up things. So, I think for, for staking is fine because you don't have to stake that often, right? Like you can just every 12 hours, maybe pull out your money and restake it, right? It doesn't have to go so much. Um, but let's say I have a lending protocol that's liquidated and DEX on another chain, right? The current way of, let's just say this, just right now the existing protocol, assuming these all exist, interchain accounts, interchain queries and, and token transfers. If I have a protocol here that wants to liquidate on a DEX over here, right? First, I move one message, move my tokens over here. I wait to get a response. Right now, I actually don't get a callback on the response. So you need a DAO to control it. And we're working with the IG team to like, you actually get triggered a callback when it finishes. Then you say, okay, now make a swap with this um, initiating accounts to make a swap of that money is sent over here for the other token, right? It may have succeeded or failed. If it succeeds, then I query to see actually how much did I get, right? The full amount I got, okay. Then oh, call over here and accounts, you transfer the tokens back to get the tokens back, right? And that's a lot of like uh, here, make a request, get a response, make a request, get a response. These are all slow requests, right? In here has orders the whole thing. Now let's say, hey, this is actually a common use case. This is not something you do once. This is something you're doing all the time. It's your business case. I want to deploy that, optimize that. I want to deploy a contract here and a contract here that what they do say is, 
uh, they have their own protocol, which is move tokens, swap them at this price, and send me all the results back. If the price, if you don't make that price, if the money is too low, right, the price is, is if the, the market won't, won't trade at this price, they return my original funds back, right? That's a really simple logic. A lot of people might want that. So, but we're not going to wait for like Go code six, eight months, 12 months to build some new Go logic with this very specific use case integrated some decks on this one chain. We say, no, we want to launch it now. So we could do it now. I wrote a query right now. We could do this very quickly. And basically say this, now we write these two contracts here. They do that. If you trust it, someone can say, okay, here, liquidate at this price. It will send one message back and then you get a callback, you know, whatever, one IBC message. Um, it will do this logic. And then you get a callback saying, okay, um, I liquidate this price. Um, great stuff. Or I failed to liquidate and here's your money back, right? Like you get it right away. That I think will allow people to do integrations um, that you couldn't even conceive of. Um, that's like, that's faster, right? This is faster. But then actually under conceive of, I'm going to give one more. So I'm working something called WinDAO, um, W-Y-N-D DAO. And we, I think the second stuff might be like, that first one I'll throw as a demo. I'll throw as a prototype and give it to y'all. It's free stuff, right? We'll be doing this for you, everyone. Um, I have a query like uses IBC price oracle osmosis is like implemented. Um, I'm waiting for TWAP out there to be finalized. But um, the next one is this, I think is the next level of really deep integration. So imagine you have a DEX on one chain and you want to make another DEX on another chain. Uh, that DEX wants to launch a sub DEX on another chain, right? That sub DEX is own separate liquidity, right? So it's going to have its own issue of liquidity and it's going to be small. It's not really that popular. But actually, I have all the liquidity on their chain. But maybe I could actually not make a generic protocol that works for anyone, but I will make a special contract between my sub-parent decks and my child decks, which is like a permissioned IBC, con like, a, like an encrypted or authenticated IBC connection that just runs from my parent decks to my child decks, right? And I will move 1% of my liquidity over here but I will keep the entire price information of all the rest of the liquidity over here. So here's actually the reference price. The reference price is here, right? And you actually had the full reference price here and that's actually what you use. Over here, um, you will assume that you have that value and you can trade a little bit of liquidity very quickly, just like an ATM or a branch bank. And so maybe it's a minute out of date of the actual price over here, right? And so you have a little slippage here, you can maybe but you only can move a 1% liquidity. You only can pull a little liquidity out here. You can't pull too much out anyway, right? Like you can't pull too much over here. So if you run on it, you run on it and it gets a new price update. But in the meantime, while things are not moving too heavily, you basically get um, immediately access. You don't have to call IBC swaps. You get immediate access like a local DEX, like immediate swap response right away. Immediate responses from a DEX locally um, with the same liquidity effectively as the parent DEX. So they basically shifted this as a, as a branch bank that's able to provide a virtual liquidity at much higher amounts and still safeguard against bank runs, um, which I think is pretty amazing. And like this idea of like protocols are not just like copying themselves over chains or they're just like, okay, we're like kind of like something like that. Like we just moved collateral over chains, but actually like integrating operations over multiple chains is I think a revolutionary concept that no one has really grasped or able to build out yet. So I think uh, one project I'll be doing besides knocking stuff out, like, you know, here's how you swap on a Juno osmosis, you know, swap on the osmosis deck from Juno with an IBC message. Um, and, you know, this has been in discussion for a while now since Lisbon. Um, and besides that kind of stuff, I want to work on basically building out next level uh, integrations of multi-chain applications that are truly multi-chain, that live on multiple chains and like balance banks between multiple chains. Thanks so much for the explanation. That is very cool. And like, yeah, it's just amazingly powerful, right? Like that's where you really see the kind of like multi-chain. I mean, already the Cosmos ecosystem has like had such an explosion of activity. And, you know, we've seen IBC be so powerful just with token transfer. And uh, I was always, uh, the thing that shocked me the most with IBC or surprised me the most was just like how actually good the user experience was. Uh, you know, I think Osmosis did like a really great job at, at that. And uh, I mean, not just Osmosis, like others, but um, and now I think having all of these more advanced things, right, with, uh, with you know, more powerful IBC stuff, with Cosmosm, it's going to be really like weird and mind bending, I think, when those come, come out. <laughs> 
you were getting multi-chain wallets and wallets have to adjust. I think there's an amazing job they did in Osmosis. I agree. It was an amazing job they did for UX like when it came out. They basically listed all of your accounts on 10 different chains or 20 different chains, right? Like on one little board, you hit deposit withdraw. Like you don't have to go to some other account and do something and then like sign into other, other blockchain app over there, go to a bridge, wait, whatever. No, he's like, on Osmosis app, it shows you when you click the button deposit, like it actually under the hood calls another chain to tell you the transfer. It signs a transfer message. It waits for relay to move over there. And 10 seconds, 20 seconds later, it's in your account, like with almost no fees. Like that's super fast and super cheap. And you don't even have to worry about it. All you remember is like, oh, my ledger, I see a different chain ID on this thing. I'm signing it. Um, but like, it's really like so transparent. And that was amazing to really make that whole, like you can bridge liquidity as transparent. So I think once you build these things, I'm talking about behind the scenes and the back ends like this, what we'll have front ends? They're so transparent, right? Like they just are smooth. And I think they did a killer job on UX and I'd love to see what, you know, uh, have those people also involved in these next level discussions and see what kind of UX they can design uh, for these multi-chain world. One question I have here is, you know, one of the big arguments that Ethereum has always made and that some other chains like Solana, for example, was also uh, emphasizing a lot. It was this idea of like, you know, composability and it's such an advantage to have, you know, contracts that are um, in the same VM, you know, where you can, ha- you can like make like atomic transactions, right? Like make like one transaction that affects like, you know, different contracts uh, in the same transaction and, you know, it all executes uh, at the same time or it fails. How how do you see that? Because that's that was often also one of the criticisms, right, of the, of the kind of Cosmos IBC concept is because you know you have like a, a transaction happening on chain A, and then it triggers something on chain B, but the, you know you can't sort of make the transaction to like trigger something on chain A and chain B like simultaneously. Now talk a little bit about like how do you see these this issue. And how do you think that, what's the impact of that going to be when you actually have interchain applications the way you described? I think it's a good point. And I think uh, it's basically just harder. It's not worse. So um, it's easy to call it locally. And I think the idea of the app chain where every app had one little use case, right? Like one is just a DEX and one issues tokens and one is NFTs and one is a lending protocol and one is like this other little piece. And you actually need five chains to make any useful DeFi ecosystem um, is kind of limited, right? So I think the extension of the DAP chain, if you're going like app chain maximalist, everyone like in little, little things, you hit the limits. However, a lot of the new architectures are going for this thing. Like Nier is sharding already. It's like asynchronous calls anyway between of it. And they realize that it can't scale up. And like, Ethereum hit the limits and they have rollups. And so effectively like, yeah, okay, you can pose on Ethereum, but like everyone goes to Polygon or Arbitrum or something like that, Optimism. And like uh, Phantom, and they're like just throwing somewhere else because they can't. Now there's like crappy bridges between them that are like hacked all the time because actually like Composable hits limit. And, and Solana's like we're vertically scale, but like we're centralized VC chain that like halts every, you know, every two weeks. So like they have limits here, right? And so clearly like, having not just vertical, but horizontal scalability gives you so much more resilience, right? Um, the problem is how do you do it? So I think you want to have like a useful modicum. If you have four apps always working together all the time, they should be in the same chain. They should be composed really nicely. They're really tightly integrated. They should integrate one chain. But there are other apps that we don't integrate with all the time. We integrate with them, you know, occasionally, right? Or every few hours, or like we don't call like in all the time. So like in Quicksilver, Quicksilver is on one chain and it stakes on that hub. And it doesn't need to be there like every single transaction. It just needs to know how to like deposit, withdraw, handle some stuff. It does its own things, but they don't have to be like this. They just have to be able to securely be able to execute operations. So I think there's a whole class of of things that don't need this immediateness of that composability. Um, And then it just comes to the point of design, of protocol design. So, I mean, a lot of devs come from JavaScript and have issues with this stuff, but like you shouldn't be coming. If you come from JavaScript, don't build IBC straight up, right? Like, uh, I want, come from like a serious like background in distributed systems or like architectures, like protocol design. You have must have wrestled with like actually like okay, what's a master slave and like multiple master database systems or like message queues and like concepts like this backend concepts that like I don't need a PhDs 
I'm just saying that like someone's wrestled with a lot of these stuff that have actually large scale backend web systems have distributed natures and you have to learn this stuff anyway. So like once you've dealt with this stuff, microservices, you kind of get some ideas, okay, how to architect stuff. Um, and these ideas are the same ideas you need for IBC. So it's just like a different concept. So I think a lot of it is training a mindset of how to design them. But once designed properly, it takes more time to design. Um, it should be easy to implement and they can be able to do most things as long as you can wait a little bit and you don't need that. You can even compose it. So like I do action, I hold it like a token transfer. If it fails or it turns your money, it is atomic. It's just atomic over a longer time span. So you can build all of that functionality. It's just a little harder to design it. That's all. Um, and so clearly if you want to have things always together, you stick them together in the same chain. It's great. But like if they need to be a little looser coupling, you can get very secure loose couplings over multiple chains. Cool. Yeah. Thanks so much. And yeah, I, I think the near point was interesting because I did a podcast with Ilya and Alexander, like a few, uh, I don't know, pretty recently, two months ago or something like that. And that was a, uh, this thing we just talked about there as well. And I thought it was very fascinating how they are, uh, you know, chose to do, uh, to have this kind of asynchronous nature, even if contracts are on the same shard, you know, cause they were like the benefits a way uh, having this composability because it allows them to you know move contracts between different charts and the developer sort of doesn't have to care right like where they are because they behave the same way uh, and so I thought that was a very interesting uh, yeah like different perspective yeah I like Nia they're smart guys yeah no, absolutely governance you wanted to talk about governance as well what's on your mind when it comes to governance yeah, I think governance is like the unexplored territory. And I mean, I, you were also around when you're trying to design the, the POS governance for uh, that. And I think in 2017, actually having some like on-chain vote control critical blocking features was like this crazy idea of heresy almost. Um, but, you know, hard fork was the only way of voting, right? Like, so it's normal now that there's on-chain governance doing things like switching parameters and, you know, releasing funds and, uh, you know, controlling upgrades. Um, that's normal now these days, right? But like that was kind of like five years ago, it was like crazy. And like POS was like this crazy invention that no one trusted would actually work. And POW is the only way. So these have proven themselves. And I think you've watched that same evolution. Um, the same way that DAOs have now come, come mainstream, suddenly they realize, oh, okay, open up this up. And now people's rust in full head, like let's just run everything as a DAO, throw tokens on there, lock them, they're great. And I think it's a problem because the same people that were naysaying it for years, uh, didn't really learn just how hey, oh, governance works. Let's use it, copy it, blindly copy paste and are now producing a lot of bad designs actually of governance designs. Um, because he's never really understood why it worked in the first place. So there's some DAOs that think they work quite well. A lot of those are membership based ones where it's actually like one person, one vote and they actually have like kind of trusted ones. Those can work amazingly well, right? Like Moloch DAO or something. And, um, or even nouns. Um, I think are interesting. A lot of these other ones are just like one token, one vote, stake it, pump and dump things. Like people, they, they, they flash loan borrowing tokens to to take over the, the governance. This happened before, right? Like, and I think you're like, wait, you can't have a flash loan be able to overrun the governance of your protocol. It's not secure anymore. You're like given up, you've over-financialized your protocol. So I think there's any safeguards there. So I've been thinking about this, like since the hub launched and since like, you know, Sunny did his famous 0% attack, commission attack, uh, attack whatever on the hub like we're like there are issues with this governance like you can do a lot of things with it it's very powerful but it has limits you have to understand the limits you understand when it works when it doesn't work right really understand this situation and I've been like I felt like I was doing a voice in the wilderness for a long time because like everything no no it's work great it's just the hub it works and like it works for the hub it's gonna work for your little chain that has a 10 million market cap or 5 million market cap it might not be secure it's secure for the hub that has a real community um, and it's proven a lot of these DAOs of small market caps are insecure with the, this, with their logic. And I think it wasn't until I pushed out a POE actually at the, the talk I did at Interchain Foundations without proof of engagement, which was like a proof of authority and proof of stake uh, missing. It got like no traction. And I wrote a white paper in it next year and we built it for T grade. So I'm, you know, if someone's learned about proof of engagement, look at T grade, I have a medium article explaining technically how it works. It's like proof of authority and proof of stake together. Uh, and a mixing function, which I think has interesting privileges. I could go on for a long thing, but it's, a, it's one piece of experimentation, right? Um, of this, of of what you have, a pure proof of stake, daily proof of stake, authority. Um, you can design other systems, and I think we really need to experiment, understand limits of the systems we have, 
um, understand where they work well and where they don't work. And it was really like Vitalik last summer, in summer 2021, he posted uh, Beyond uh, Coin Weighted, uh, Token Weighted Governance, I believe. Um, uh, and remember the DGov and where the limits are. And it's kind of a theoretical thing. He's talking about soul bound tokens now. Um, and for me, that's like, okay, sure. Uh, that's what I was pitching 2019, that we have soul bound tokens, which are basically proof of authority, um, which you have engagement, who, who reputation, put your reputation token, which cannot transfer. Okay. Clearly you cannot transfer reputation, sell it. So you have your reputation on the chain, which you cannot sell or buy, which is your time in the chain and you have your money. So if you're like the old time that's done stuff, but don't have any money in the game, you shouldn't have any vote. And you have a bunch of money, but no say, do anything, who are you? So it's like this mixture of like actually having done work and actually having money on the table and like putting your money where the mouth is. So I think that combination is what experiment and proof of engagement and T-grade. Um, and it's just one experiment, right? It's one experiment here. And it's not the answer. I think it's an interesting space we opened up. And I think I look at Dow Dow, which is a really, really cool project on Juno. So, you know, big shout out to Jake Cartel for doing that one. They've had like no raise, uh, self-organized community, just doing their things. Uh, they've gotten like over a dozen devs, I believe, without funding, um, just believing in DAOs, which is, I think it's the most successful, it is the most successful non-DeFi project built on Cosmosm. Awesome. Um, so DAO, 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 zone, and you can launch your own DAO like that. And so they have, you know, uh, multi-sig type DAOs, where, like you vote people in, it's just, you know, who knows who. You have DAOs based on uh, tokens, just like the standard DAOs you see in Ethereum everywhere. You have DAOs based on NFT holding. You have DAOs with um, uh, mixed token weighting. Uh, we're building a module to extend it for WinDAO, uh, which is using like curve style, multi-level token weighting. And I'd like to take that one and then they have, well, have sub DAOs, workflows between like you can partially delegate authority to a sub DAO, which has these people which is pointed here, can overridden. And these larger stuff like Aragon is building back on Ethereum before they kind of died out or petered out. Um, they're building all these cool tooling out there. So I think um, it's a great toolkit because they're building a lot of components to allow people to mostly point and click on the web interface, build their own DAOs, um, but access to all kinds of different models, all kinds of different rules. And um, I built a lot of these early contracts in 2020, 2021 as like demo contracts and multi-sigs and voting stuff. And they took this stuff and built UI and they just went with it. They, like, they've gone way beyond what I built. So I'm really, really impressed with them. And I think it really, you know, shows that Cosmos is not Ethereum. It's Cosmos is really the forefront of governance. And it has been. I mean, like what was launched the hub was already cutting edge, like on-chain governance and POS uh, was cutting edge in 2019, right? In 2017, no one believed it would work. In 2019, it was launched in mainnet. It was cutting edge. And I think Dow is bringing this, like the next level of this, really bringing like new ideas of governance um, to a new level. Yeah, no. I mean, I think that's something. I think also, you know, we talked about mentioned this on this podcast before, but that that's just like stands out to me so much. Like, actually, I remember when, you know, when we were like working on Cosmos in twenty seventeen. Uh, I mean, there was there were others, right, who were basically like other blockchains, proof of stake blockchains. There were also, uh, you know, I think specifically Tezos and Polkadot, right, that also had the kind of governance mechanisms in there. And they talked a lot about like, oh, you know, how they have this like elegant, powerful, complex governance scheme. And I feel like for Cosmos, it was more like, yeah, we're going to have this governance, right? But it wasn't so much at the, at the front and center. And it was also kind of simple in comparison. But, you know, I think it has ended up like, I mean, uh, um, I think Polkadot governance is just like very confusing and I think too complicated. And, and I was like reading at some point that they're actually moving to a more Cosmos style model. I'm not totally sure if this is true or not, or, or if I misread that, but, uh, and then Tezos, I think the big issue was that, you know, only validators could vote, which is not ideal. No, like, I mean, I should, I think, and then so I think the Cosmos model was really like just very nice, right? That you have like validators vote by default, but then individual token holders can override it. And what I think has been just amazing is like the amount of adoption that has gotten, right? Where you have like on the Cosmos hub, you know, often like, you know, 80,000 accounts or something like that, or, you know, a voting and, you know, same as most is like huge participation. Uh, but then, of course, you're totally right, right? Like, this is just one form of governance. And it makes sense for some forms, but, like, it, it's it's 
there's obviously also downsides there, right? That you have, okay, someone with a million tokens and there's someone else with a hundred tokens and the person with a hundred tokens may be like super engaged and know a lot. And uh, so that's, uh, you know, it's a hard problem, but at least I, I feel like the, yeah, the Cosmos model has already gotten, uh, gotten pretty far and works pretty well and has gotten surprising amounts of engagement. And I'm, you know, I'm excited to see uh, like the kind of DAO DAO and like the other models that can be built. Yeah, I think that Cosmos model actually works quite well for most cases. If there's engaged community, like, you know, if, if most token holders care about the chain, right. And are right. You actually have engaged community and you have like a solid market cap. Like it works pretty well, actually. Um, but those are ifs. So like when you see a chain with not much usage and the market cap drops to one or two million, this bear market, which has happened. Um, it's, it's a problem. And what happened in Terra, like when they emitted 5 billion Luna or 5 trillion Luna, I don't know, 5 quadrillion Luna, I'm not sure how many, um, they halted voting because it was a hat attack. Like some random person that just bought this for like 0. 0.00001 cent has now owned 50% of our governance. They could delegate their thing and take over the whole chain, right? Like, uh, like they realized the limit of it. And so this is, I'm just saying there's failure modes in it, right? There's failure modes you have to be aware of. Um, and that is extreme failure mode. Um, but I think any of these small chains is under 5 million, 10 million market cap and has low engagement um, is just basically waiting for it. And so if they were ever actually had a higher value at one point and they went down to this level, um, that means someone's going to snap them up, right? So I think it means just like the, the, the POS works well if you say, hey, token code is actually engaged and there's a solid market cap. No random schmo uh, hacker can just buy up a bunch of tokens and like take over because like you can't. Right, you can't buy them out because people care about stuff. Um, but yeah, yeah, and and I think it works well in the sort of like you know the decision about oh should we go there or should we do this, right? But what it doesn't, what it doesn't really work well for, is a sort of you know organizing work and collaborating to do stuff. So for example, I think the whole mechanisms of like using governance to you know, for proposals, for funding proposals, I think is not work. I mean, it sort of works, but it's not ideal, right? Because uh, I think then, you know, someone proposes something, people are like, all right, that sounds reasonable. And they defund it. But like, was that the best thing to fund? Or like maybe something else that like, or in a different way, or someone else had the same idea. And like, so I, I think that's, for example, one thing where like the existing governance, I feel is, is, isn't great. Yeah, I, mean, I think there's a cool thing DAO does work in sub DAOs that actually can like take the staking vote as like the basis of who has voting power and have your own different logic on it. Or like subgroups of them can can vote on it. So they were like not having no tokens, actually using the staking token of the native thing. And then also allowing sub DAOs. So like, okay, this DAO is appointed by the main uh the main governance can now appoint this DAO to do certain things, like vote and funding. Uh, with some sort of budget, right? And they, the, but the parent uh, governance can revoke them. Hey, this committee is not working very well. Get rid of these guys. You know, they just waste the money. Like, but so you don't have to have the 80,000 people involved in every funding discussion, negotiations. You can actually have negotiations with a counterparty um, and they can spend, you know, a million or two a month maybe on funding projects and ecosystem. And if the money is going to bad places, you just basically swap them out with someone else. Um, right? So like, and that might make sense in a way of more decentralized than saying you have a foundation, this intransparent foundation funding stuff, right? Like it would actually allow a decentralized way of doing it. It's actually controlled by on-chain governance. Um, but still, you're right. Like you don't need 80,000 people in discussion when someone's trying to negotiate like a funding, I will do this feature for your chain. And then like, you're like, okay, I'm waiting two months in public discussions to figure out whether or not I get funded or not. I'm going somewhere else. It's a little faster. Um, but I think you can definitely do it. And I think, yeah, data allows you to add that on to existing governance and kind of just not replace the standard one, but like extend places with this cool well thanks so much Ethan it was really really great to have you on like you mentioned call you know the Cosm Wasm Academy maybe that's something uh some people may be interested in uh can you tell a bit more about that like you know if people want to kind of get started and developing on top of Cosm Wasm like where should they go and like what's the kind of offering that Cosm Wasm Academy has for them cool so um, yeah, the Cosmosm Academy, academy.cosmosm.com uh, is, you can sign up now. Uh, we'll be opening up, I believe, early September, uh, maybe mid-September. 
Let's see how the times lines are. I slip a little bit. We're working for quite a while. We have quite a few videos online. The platform's already online. Uh, we're trying to finish up uh, a first version of it. We had a preview already in Seoul. But yeah, uh, in a few weeks, uh, early mid-September, we have it going on. Um, sign up there. You will get basically bottom and top Rust courses explaining how to build contracts in Rust uh, from an expert train developer at Confio who's working a year and a half now with us, building all kinds of Rust contracts and building a Cosmosm and multi-test and lots of these toolings you've used, going through how to build contracts, explaining Rust, explaining contract logic, explaining how to build everything up there. So if you have basic Rust knowledge, uh, sign up for that class and it will take you into like advanced Cosmosm development. Uh, I think this is really a way we want to do democratize people. So we really get the skills of how to build good Cosmosm contracts out there and complex Cosmosm contracts, how to compose contracts, how to build these systems out there. Um, and when everyone, it's for everyone, it's free. So yeah, it's basically us trying to train out a whole new generation of really skilled Cosmos developers. That's amazing. Cool. And how long is the course? Uh, the course is 10 weeks. It's uh, 10 classes. They're one week long. Uh, there's some take-home work for you to do with them. Um, you probably could do it faster if you're skilled already, but yeah, it's a 10 one-week things. Cool. Fantastic. That sounds like a great experience. Yeah, yeah. No, it should be. And I definitely, it's for everyone. It's for the people. And feedback's welcome. Uh, please give feedback out there. If you have stuff, we want to make it better. We'll have other stuff on Cosm.js and front-end stuff coming later as well. Um, other courses. We have also some full-stack courses coming up, lined up for you. I also wanted to mention WinDAO briefly. And so uh, there's, I mentioned earlier, it's basically uh, a DAO we're launching or have launched on Juno uh, for doing uh, IBC-based contracts. I think it was going to be the cutting edge of a lot of this stuff, scaling out protocols both vert horizontally, not just vertically, but horizontally. Um, I think it's very interesting stuff we're building out there uh, to reach huge scales and really push what IBC can do and how it can make like an actual interchain native protocols. Um, there is an airdrop out there. I want to say if you get this before end of August, until August 2020, we have an airdrop, airdrop.winddow.com, wind with a Y, and check out more there. For all Juno Osmond region stickers. Okay, I'll, I'll check that out as well. Cool. Well, thanks so much, uh, Ethan, for coming on. It was really great uh, to have you on the podcast. It's amazing, like, all of the work you've done and the uh, way you've contributed to the Cosmos ecosystem and I'm super excited to see like you know what are people going to build in this like you know next generation of stuff that's going to come with you know Cosmosm and mixing that with you know the new IBC capabilities and then with all these people that are going to be trained through Cosmosm Academy. Yeah I'm excited I'm excited I was dreaming of IBC since like you know five years now six years now of like what we can do so we're ecosystems here everything's ready the tools are ready the infrastructure foundation's ready and like let's just build build guys. Cool. And yeah, check out Cosm Awesome. Check our chat Discord uh, website. Everything is on there. Chat.cosmos.com for Discord. Lots of good help there. Um, yeah, come on. Cool. Thanks so much, Ethan. And of course, we'll include links to all of those in the show notes. And thanks so much for our listener for once again tuning in. Uh, if you want to support the show, make sure to leave us an iTunes review. Let us know what you think of the episode on Twitter. Share it. Uh, with people you think would be find it interesting and yeah we look forward to being back next week